The Last Detail, directed by Hal Ashby, starring Jack Nicholson. This is a 4K from Shout Factory. Just came in with a cool poster, so let's check it out. There's Jack. There he is. In all his glory. I, I like that Shot Factory does this. They have the posters for a lot of their 4K sets I've noticed lately. and It's kind of a cool thing. Although now I have a lot of poster tubes around here and not enough wall space. I'm a huge Jack Nicholson fan. And The Last Detail has always been one of those movies that has been on the list of one of the ones that like the last five that I haven't seen. Another one I haven't seen is Carnal Knowledge. But I started with One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest, Chinatown, As Good As It Gets, Witches of Eastwick, Mars Attacks, Something's Gotta Give even, you know, The Departed. I've seen a lot of Jack Nicholson films, but this one I hadn't seen. I was excited. I actually had a DVD version that it was included on a six pack of prison movies that I got at Menards in the, in the bargain bin for $5. And to say the least, I believe I fell asleep attempting to watch it. So I don't count that viewing, but I just got done watching it. And man, I gotta say, they don't make them like they used to. Directed by Hal Ashby and written by Robert Town, this gem of a film stars Jack Nicholson in a 1973 Best Actor or Academy Award nominated performance as Budusky, a street tough sailor. When he is tasked with escorting a charge to naval prison, Budusky decides they're never going to make it unless he and his partner show the young screw-up one last good time. Nicholson character is, is refers to himself as badass and his partner Mule, and the person that they're trying to escort to the prison is named Larry, played by Randy Quaid, and Mule is played by Otis Young. So the guys decide badass and Mule, they decide that they want to show this 18-year-old guy, you know, a great time. A great time full of beer, women, and just life lessons. How to stand up for yourself with when your order's wrong at, at, at the diner. There's a particular scene early on where Nicholson is on Randy Quaid for, for not sending his uh, eggs back. And then later in the film, Randy Quaid stands up for himself. The Last Detail is a road trip movie. It's, it's a fly on the wall movie where we're following the three guys navigate different cities and you learn about the characters you learn that randy quaid's character has a lot of issues a lot of emotional issues possibly ptsd type things going on and and just he has these breakdowns and he also tries to escape a couple times or and he also threatens suicide so mule and badass are you know they're kind of babysitters but they also want to have fun and they uncuff they uncuff larry a few times let him free and and you know they they do show them a good time. They do come through on their promises. It's just, you know, it's one of those films that is very slow, very slow, very much of its time, very much of the 70s. But I liked it. I, I liked the character study. I liked getting to know these guys a little bit and, and kind of going on that journey as far as the two guys that are, are in charge of taking Larry you know, badass and mule that they they don't really want to go back to the regular services of being in the Navy. They don't want to go back to that. Just the same old, same old. They want to have fun too. Then you have Larry who is about to serve an eight year sentence and be, you know, not going to be have much fun for a long time. So he wants to soak it up too. And he doesn't even know, like, he's, you know, he's just 18. He's not able to drink. There's a scene where Nicholson puts a gun on the bar and demands that the bartender give Larry beer. You know, this performance is good. It's not, I don't think it's as good as like Five Easy Pieces or as good as it gets or One Flew Cuckoo's Nest that, that Nicholson has won for. But I think it's an effective performance and you kind of see his growth from Easy Rider to now. And, you know, it's... This was an early performance for Nicholson, and he definitely shows why he's he's a legend. Now, as far as special features, this is a uh, 4K restoration from the original camera negative, and it looks great. It looks and sounds great. It's probably the best we're going to get. It's got a lot of film grain, so if you're not in the film grain, <laughs> it is what it is. It wasn't shot on a digital camera, it was shot on film. And, you know, I, I think the details really shine. And then there's an introduction by filmmaker Alexander Payne about a trip, appreciation by Alexander Payne. And Payne talks about the screenwriter Robert Town 
wrote Chinatown as well, and he considers Chinatown and The Last Detail screenplays that filmmakers should read. He thinks there's, there, he thinks he considers those like the the two best screenplays ever written. He talks about Hal Ashby and the history behind the film. Alexander Payne also mentions that Nicholson actually prefers this role and considers it like a risky role for him at the time. We also have a Search for Truth interview with editor Robert C. Jones, and I will say the editing on this is definitely unique. You know, you have a two people talking to each other, and in the middle there's like this this fade in, fade out, crossfade of 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 uh, like a wide shot. Or then walking, and then you get back to the to the people talking to each other. It's all in one scene. It's very very much a unique style of editing. So what I recommend, Last Detail. I would recommend Last Detail, especially for Nicholson fans and any fans of 70s cinema. But let me know what you guys thought of the Last Detail. Did you guys pick it up? Let me know. All right. So I went to the store. Target and got Matchbox Top Gun Maverick. Unfortunately, there's only one plane in here. I have some questions. As you can see, there's the one plane here. Then you have the jet fuel, which, you know, makes sense because we're going back to the danger zone. You gotta have fuel. This black car, and remind me where this was in the movie because maybe that's the car that Ed Harris had in the beginning. I don't know. I'm not sure why that's here. Then you have this, like, silver camaro now was that the car that penny was driving at the end maybe that's a, that's a stretch though i don't think that was then this number three car this it looks like something james bond would drive or maybe like you know vin diesel if he time traveled back to the 60s so matchbox what's going on with this what's going on what's the deal What's the deal with the Matchbox Top Gun Maverick? Also, why did I buy this? Heartbreakers. Is it as advertised? What is this movie? Los Angeles painter Arthur Blue and businessman Eli Kahn are the best of friends, commiserating and competing always, whether on the actual racquetball court or in the singles bar. When Blue's long-term girlfriend Sid leaves him for a more successful artist and Eli's father passes away, they each fall for a beguiling French art gallery manager and their fragmented bromance enters crisis mode. They call it a bromance, best of friends, Arthur and Eli playing racquetball, and right away you see their competitive nature. Not only have they known each other for a long time, they they share financial information, they share women, they share they have they're just they're totally bros. Like there's a there's a scene where Eli takes a girl home and Arthur's there. Arthur ends up watching them almost have sex and then the guys, the best friends end up like Ha having a conversation over the woman the woman's like okay well what do i do you know kind of deal so these guys are close man and the, and the friendship is very complicated so arthur blue he's been making art but it's not like the art that he wants to make or really is into so to like impress his girlfriend he quits and he's like i want to start new i want to get aggressive i want to open my own show my own gallery type thing let's let's do this she ends up leaving him anyway and sleeping with another artist so when he finds out, he confronts the artist, you know, how does it feel to sleep with my woman kind of deal. And then you have Eli, he's close to his father and his father passes away. So he's on the fritz too, on a downer. Eli is the romantic one. He's like, oh, I'm going to, he jumps to that, he's, he's extremely, he, he jumps to these crazy like extremes where he's like, oh, I'm going to marry that woman. That She's the one, she's, the, she's, the, you know, he falls head over heels for these women. And Arthur has always been like the one to kind of, play it cool and then you know when Eli messes up he gets the girl kind of thing if he wants her and that's what they claim that Sid Arthur's ex who leaves him for another artist that's how Eli confronts him like hey you you know I'm the one that met Sid first so now he's the one meeting the actually Arthur meets the French uh, cur curator uh, before Eli but Eli falls hard for her ends up going to her, like her yoga class and they end up having a coffee and then Eli's got a funny line too where he has sex with with the French lady and then Arthur's like so you guys didn't make love you had sex and he's like well what's the difference you know he's like you tell me women are so complicated so these guys are still trying to figure out women and and and, and they're always competing so 
Candy is Arthur's muse, and, and the, the real art that Arthur wants to make is like this BDSM type paintings, sort of like Betty Page type thing. So Candy is the model for that, and he does these paintings of her that are going to be in his gallery, his show. And Eli comes over one night, and, and Candy's there, and they, and they both want to have sex with Candy, so they have a threesome. That's the kind of relationship these guys have. Very competitive, but very open. Bobby Roth comes up with some great scenarios and unique dialogue. I mean, the whole idea of two really close friends and the fact that they share women and they share they share finances. They, you know, they're practically dating, but it's very heterosexual, very, very like competitive testosterone going on here. It's a unique dynamic. You don't see that in films. I don't think I've seen it before, or I haven't seen it since. Here's the cover. And then there's the back of the O-ring, comes out, I'm assuming this is the original poster, and then there's a booklet. And this was released by Fun City Editions, which is a partner label of Vinegar Syndrome. But there's a whole essay in here about the film and behind the scenes. Uh, very, very cool. Very, very, very well done packaging. This is a new 2K transfer restored from the 35 millimeter interpositive. So the transfer looks really good, really, really solid. Pieces of Me, a newly filmed video interview directed by Bobby Roth. Pieces of My Life, a newly filmed video interview with director Bobby Roth. This is a great interview. They ask him a lot of behind the scenes questions, how he was as a filmmaker at the time, what it was like being an artist in LA type of thing, who he based the characters off of. It's, it's very informative. Mr. Amor and, and Mr. Outside, a newly filmed video interview with stars Peter and Nick. Great interview as well. Some of them are over Zoom, but it's a fairly new interview and I, I definitely recommend it. Video introduction by Bobby Roth, an image gallery, an isolated music track. So the music is done by Tangerine Dream, did the soundtrack for Thief and Sorcerer, among others. Great soundtrack. There's also some really cool 80s songs. Newly recorded audio commentary by filmmaker Chris O'Neill and Bill Ackerman of the Supporting Characters podcast. I'll have to check that out. Movies 99 Minutes from 1984, Heartbreakers. It gives my uh, my highest recommendation. This movie is definitely worth checking out, especially if you're a fan of dramedies, sex comedy, sexual, you know, racy stuff, cool 80s vibes. If you're into that, the Heartbreakers has it all. So definitely... Check it out, let me know if you ordered it. Don't mess with Mr. Majestic's melons. Cinema's most rugged tough guy, Charles Bronson, stars as Vince Majestic, an ex-con and Vietnam vet whose efforts to run a farm are threatened by narrow-minded locals and corrupt cops. But when a mafia hitman destroys Majestic's crop, the farmer's fuse is finally blown. With his rifle in hand and his girlfriend at the wheel, he goes after the syndicate assassin and from high-speed back road chases to explosive backwoods confrontation, mobster and maverick stalk each other, two of a kind, antagonists to, to the death. Directed by Hollywood ace Richard Feister and written by legendary Elmore Leonard, Mr. Majestic features wonderful supporting turns by Lee Purcell, Paul Coslo, and Taylor Lockler. Al Lettieri plays the hitman, Charles Bronson plays Vince Majestic. What can I say? It starts out classic Bronson. He has a watermelon crop and he wants people to help him pick the melons. He's got so many acres and so little time. He hires a family of immigrants and, you know, he takes a fancy to one of the ladies, checks her out. And one of the convenience store workers gives the lady a hard time for wanting to use the bathroom. Bronson steps in, like, you're going to let her use the bathroom. She's not going to steal anything. It's all good, man. Anyway, it escalates. He roughs, roughs him up and she uses the bathroom. She becomes his girlfriend. That's how it's done. Charles Bronson. They return back to his crop. There's already a family working. There are these like hillbilly family that's there and, and they're, they're already picking the melons and claiming that they get a percentage and all this stuff. And so Bronson ends up uh, saying, screw that. He ends up going to jail. He ends up going to jail for what he does to these, these people to defend his crops. They're in jail. He meets a hitman played by Al Lettieri, who's great in the film does a great job as a hitman to so meet the hitman and they're being escorted to the main prison on this this van type thing and Altieri's guys the hitman's guys show up and they stop the stop the van from getting there 
Bronson ends up evacuating the van, but only leaving him and the hitman. And the hitman's still handcuffed. So Bronson decides to take the hitman with him in the van. And this is all like the first 10, 15 minutes. So it's super action packed. There's negotiations to get like a sentence down. The hitman doesn't want to go back to prison. Majestic doesn't want to go either. So they, there's negotiations to get their like, like their subtle their prison time down to a minimum and the hitman really goes toe to toe with Bronson and it leads to like this great showdown at the end. I will say the middle sort of lags a little bit. There's like twenty minutes they probably could have cut out of this film, but other than that, I really enjoyed it. All right, so this is a brand new 2K Master from Kino Lorber, Mr. Majestic, and there is reversible art, pretty neat. Special features, audio commentary by film historian Paul Talbot, author of the Bronson's Loose books, interview with director of photography Richard H. Klein. I did watch that, and Klein talks about how Bronson did most of his stunts in the film, particularly this one where he's in the back of a truck, and he, he uh, sh he pushes the tail tailgate down with his legs and fires a shotgun at the car. And, you know, he does a lot of the scenes, a lot of the physical stuff. So he thought that was very impressive. And they did that shot in one take. Interview with actress Lee Purcell, TV spot and theatrical trailers. So you get some solid special features here. As far as the transfer, it looks great. 2K transfer on Blu-ray, sound is awesome too. So if you're a, a Bronson fan, I have to say this is one of my favorite Bronson films now. I haven't seen all of them, but I, I you know, I definitely would say Mr. Majestic is a lot of fun. There's a lot of funny dialogue and you know what you're signing up for with the Charles Bronson movie and this exceeded that expectation. So go check out Mr. Majestic. This has been Return of the Disc. I'm Dan. For more Return of the Disc, visit returnofthedisc.com. Check out the audio version of today's show, available on all major podcast platforms. And be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel.